The only downside of being in Romans for as long as we have and as long as we will be is that I'm inadvertently now attributing pretty much everything in the world to the Apostle Paul. You say the Apostle Paul so much, I, I think last week in my sermon, because I go back through and kind of critique and pick up on stuff that I could do better next time, and <laughs> I, think I, I think I said, and you all know that I said, that the Apostle Paul told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. Did anybody hear that? <laughs> Some of y'all caught it. I just have to say right at the start, that isn't true. <laughs> Paul was not there. Uh, he, he is not the first and the last. And uh, the other night I told Miranda that the Apostle Paul wanted us to get hideaway pizza. And <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just made that up. But... I still don't think she would have believed it. Um, so please bear with me. Sometimes when I'm in the when I'm in the the throes of the sermon, these little things that if I was totally conscious, I'd never say that. But just just bear with me. You guys can just repost them as little gaffes, and maybe that'll get more people to pay attention to the lesson. But we're in Romans. Seven, And if, if I were to do a summary of the last two weeks in Romans 7, we're going to be looking just at verse 6 today. But if, if I were to do a summary of verses 1 through 5, this is Paul's argument. He's saying that <clears throat> you can be married to the law or you can be married to Christ. And... If you are married to the law, what you will bear, like you would bear in any kind of union, you will bear fruit. But he says that if you bear fruit with the law, it will be fruit unto death. But if you are married to Christ and joined together with Christ in that union, you will bear fruit for God. That's the argument. And the, the, you know, the call is, what are you truly joined to? Who are you, what or who are you joined to this morning? I think one of the things that you could, you probably picked up on is that it's possible to say I'm joined to Christ, but to actually still be bound to the law. Because Paul said over in Galatians, those are Christians. Those are Christians. These are people who professed Jesus Christ. They called Jesus Christ Lord. And those people, he says, because you have You've taken Christ plus circumcision. He says, here's the deal. You are now severed from Christ. And you're obligated to keep the whole law. They were, they were professing Christ. They believed they were followers of Christ. But because their conception of justification and salvation was rooted in law keeping and self-righteousness, Paul says that they had chosen the path of making it on their own rather than receiving this gift of Christ that would instantly transfer them to salvation. So you can either be married to law or you can be married to Christ, just a matter of which you want to bear fruit for. So it's important that we understand that it's possible to conceive of myself even as being joined with Christ in that way and to really not be. Now, Chapter 7 and verse 6, listen to this. He says, but now we've been set free from the law, having died to that which held us captive in order for us to serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the letter. Let me read that last part again. In order that we might serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the letter. If you were to gather a bunch of Pharisees and sit them down and say, I'd like you to rank your very least favorite scriptures, this one, I think, would jump to the top of the list. Just notice the terminology. New. New way. Don't, we, no, don't tell me new I want old way. I want tried and true way. New way. Not only that, not only new way, but new way of spirit. Spirit is 
The word in the New Testament for spirit is the same word for wind. Just try to get your hands around wind. Try to lasso the wind. Try to contain the wind in a box. Pharisees don't like this very much. They don't like it at all. I want the old way. I want the letter. Because I can at least, you know, get out my spectacles and I can see. There it is. And I can put a finger on it. And now, Paul says, this is the new way of the spirit, not the old way of the letter. Now, you can do it the old way. We've, I've mentioned this two weeks in a row now. You can do it that way. You can go about life that way. You can have the strictest code of conduct for your own life. You can meet all of the rules that you yourself have built. You can even take a perfect standard like the law, which Paul says is holy and righteous and good. And you can say, that's my standard. But if you do it, the fruit you will bear is the fruit unto death. Why? Why? Why can I not? Why can I desiring salvation not take hold of a law that's holy and righteous and good and attain to salvation with those two things? Those, you think that's all the necessary ingredients? Is a desirous heart and a perfect recipe? But Paul says in verse 5, while we were in the flesh, the passions of sin through the law were working in our members to bear fruit for death. Here's, here's the deal. Paul says in just a few verses, we're not there, it's going to be in chapter 7. Paul says the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh. What do we know of spirit and flesh? These two things are, are magnets with their, their poles turned the wrong direction. So you get spirit that comes down, and I'm flesh. What it does, I try to bring it in, just like that. Now God's here, spirit, and I might be pulling it in, but it's pushing me further. Paul says, we know that these two things in Galatians 5 are opposed to one another to keep you from doing what you are to be doing. The spirit and the flesh. They're opposed to one another. Therefore, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Because the desires of the spirit are against the desires of the flesh. Those two are against one another. Now, <clears throat> Before we really get into what Paul means by this new way of the Spirit, I want to address a potential concern and, and give a defining point on, uh, you know, because it's the, the concern I think is going to come from anybody who's been paying attention. Because, you know, some of these messages, you can't, you can't answer every single possible question that might arise on the basis of something that was said the former week, or we'd be doing four-hour sermons. And I'm already doing longer than average. Did you just say, mm-hmm? <laughs> I'm already doing longer than average. Mm-hmm. I heard that right from the back. <laughs> well, today we're going extra long. So <laughs> he, let me give a defining point here if I were to say what is a Pharisee you know a Pharisee by the way a Pharisee is not somebody that pays really close attention to the law and has a deep desire to uphold it that's not a Pharisee go read Psalm 119 written by David every single verse it's the longest chapter in the whole Bible every single verse mentions the law Literally. Go read it. Speaks of it in terms of law or statutes or command. Or, but it's a synonym. It's Psalm 119. Now don't go read it right now because i got a lot more for you to hear. But go read it later. 
And that was written by David, a man after God's own heart, and he's saying that the meditation of his heart was on the law of God day and night. It isn't, a Pharisee isn't somebody that says, I want to know this word and I want to live by it. That's not a Pharisee. A Pharisee is somebody who reads this book and they even memorize this book and they totally miss the point. That's a Pharisee. Pharisee can look at every single thing in the riches and the depths of the Word of God and they come away with nothing more than living on the margins. They miss the substance for a few particulars that are external. That's a Pharisee. Pharisee understands civil law. They understand what the law says concerning slaves and neighbors and aliens coming into your land and how to deal with those kinds of cases. But they totally miss the point of all of them, which Jesus brought us back to, which is love your neighbor. That's what the point of all of it was. Why did God care so much about the way people were treated and the way that husbands dealt with wives and that masters dealt with slaves and that people of Israel dealt with the immigrant? Why did he care so much about it and give so many rules about it? It wasn't just to give rules. It was to say, love your neighbor. The Pharisee missed all of that. Pharisee is somebody who sees only the margins. The reason I bring that out is because you might get the idea, a, a conscientious Christian who says, I want to know the book. I, I want to live by it. Paul says over in 1 Timothy that all scripture is breathed out of the mouth of God and on that basis is profitable for teaching and for correction and for reproof and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be equipped for every single good work. Let's I, uh, Timothy, Second Timothy. Thank you, brother. I said first Timothy. So... It isn't, a, it isn't a pharisaical thing to want to know the book. And I think a conscientious Christian would see new way of the Spirit, not the old way of the letter. And they might get the idea that we're suggesting that there's no longer a standard because we're no longer under the law. It couldn't be further from the truth. This very scripture summarizes and, and brings us into focus on what the standard now is. It's the standard of the Spirit. Who's that? Well, Jesus. You, we've been in this now for, this is three weeks. What has Paul contrasted with the law? You're either married to the law or you're married to Christ. He says, like brothers and sisters, just like you understand marital law and the severing of the former union when a death transpired and you were free from that former spouse to marry another because a death transpired and marital law no longer had a bind on you. Paul said in verse 4, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, so that you may be joined to another. And then he qualifies that as him who was raised from the dead, we were severed from law in order to belong to Jesus. His big case is that it's either law or it's Christ. Those are the only two options. Now in verse 7, when Paul talks about the new way of the Spirit versus the old way of the written code or the written letter or the law, whatever your version says, who's the Spirit? When he's making it in contrast, Christ. This is the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Jesus himself. I am with you always, said Jesus. It's his spirit. It's the Holy Spirit of Jesus. This is the spirit of God. So, we're... Don't, don't get the idea that because we're not under the law, that we're not under a standard. It's now, your standard is now Jesus, the person of Jesus. 
That's a bigger and fuller and grander and richer standard than what can be contained on a few pages. Do we see that? Now, my question is, and I hope you're asking this question, what does it mean to serve in the new way of the Spirit? What does that mean? That's what I want to get to the bottom of. I have four statements this morning of what that means to serve in the new way of the Spirit. And each of these is just to help us get our heads around it. If we were to have more conversation where you say, how do you get that from this passage? I think it'll be intuitive. I think you'll just see. Well, that's where that came from. This all comes from meditation just on this verse, not going anywhere else, just verse 6. Four statements that are a different angle of this same idea. What does it mean to serve in the new way of the Spirit? And Christian, I, I hope that your heart and your mind is locked in here because this, this is our way. How many watch... Mandalorian, this is the way. That's his famous statement. This is really the way. What did Jesus mean when he said, I am the way? This is the way. This is the new way of the Spirit. What's your path? How do you live? How do you conduct yourself? Is it what Christ came to call us to or is it a new way of doing the old way and really just doing the old way with new particulars? That's the question. What does it mean to walk in the new way of the Spirit? It means four things. Number one, it means that we look now to the Spirit of Jesus with the same exactness and the same precision that the Pharisee did to the letter of the law. I want you to imagine a dingy room with stone walls, a grass and branch made roof, dirt floors, the back of the room, a wooden desk behind which is sitting a man with a quill in hand and a 10 inch beard. And he's got a robe on and tassels touching the ground. And before him laid out on this table is a big old scroll, a heavy scroll made out of animal skin. And it's the Torah. It's the law, the perfect and righteous law of God. And he has this before him. And he's looking very closely and he's copying everything that he sees here. And he's writing it into a new place so that there can be a copy of it. And the precision and the detail that he's putting into this, and this is historical, is not that he's copying sentence by sentence. He's not even copying word by word. He's copying letter by letter. He might look over and know that it's the word the, but when he reads the word the, he comes over and writes a T, and he goes back and says, what's the next letter? Well, it's H, and then he comes back and he writes the H. And there's a system of counting and knowing exactly how many letters exist in each book. And that's the precision that I'm going to put to it. Because when I'm done with this, I don't want there to be human error. This is the word of God. I want a, a detail put to it. Now, take that picture and imagine if we were to take that kind of precision and that kind of exactness and that kind of desire looking at the life of Jesus and the person of Jesus and the spirit of Jesus and drawing our cues that exactly to the person of Jesus. That's the new way of the Spirit. I want to look on his life and form my life on that. This is not that I'm going to go out with an idea that I got from somebody else about the person of Jesus. Or even that I got from a show about the person of Jesus. I'm going to go into the book and see everything that's recorded for me of who he was so I can get the best idea of who he was. 
I want to know the tenderness of Christ to touch a leper and the boldness of Christ to turn a table. And I want the shrewdness to know when I should do one and not the other. Concerning his life and accomplishments in Jewish custom and law, Paul said, everything I had gained, all that he'd memorized under Gamaliel, all that I had gained, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This is about knowing Jesus the same way that the Pharisee knew the law, the same way that the Jew could pin it down to the letter. To serve in the new way of the Spirit means that we're looking every day, every moment. What does Christ will? What does he desire? What would he do? And I don't need a bracelet to remind me. Number two, to serve in the new way of the Spirit means that our journey to heaven and eternal salvation is a journey where there is a proximity and a union and an intimacy with the Spirit of Jesus Christ rather than an exercise of willpower and heartless checklists. See the difference between those two things? My journey to that shore daily, every moment of my life, is that of an intimate walk with the person of Jesus Christ rather than a rigid, heartless exercise of willpower and my ability to keep checklists. Where am I getting this idea that it's this intimate walk? What has Paul likened it to in the first few verses of chapter 7? the most intimate union that we share in this life. Namely, that of what? Marriage. Marriage. It's that close. Not the picture of marriage you get on a sitcom where the husband's a doofus, the wife nails him for it, and everybody laughs. But the picture of marriage that God designed where he said they were two, but they will be one. What God has joined together, let nobody separate. It's that kind of intimacy. That's, that is what the Christian walk is. We do a great disservice when people come to Jesus Christ and it's our first thing to go tell them, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this rather than them coming to know this person and pay attention to that person, which was the first thing of what it means, and then to be joined to, together with him to say, I want to be with him, that's somebody I want to spend my days with. Our journey to salvation is that of an intimate walk with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, do you have a friend in whom you confide? Is there a person on this earth that you can just talk to and you just trust them and you can just share with them anything? Do you confide in your spouse? Imagine a person who has the totality of your trust. You're totally comfortable with them. That's to be Jesus. This is what it means. He says that, you know, well, he, he doesn't say this. This is what I said. <laughs> See, everything in the world is attributed to Paul. How close are you with him, with Jesus? This is a real question. Is he, would you say right now, I'm close with him? Man, he is my Lord. Do you bear your heart before him? Do you have private moments in tears 
with him? Do you speak to him and crave it? Do you even have moments of laughter talking with him? Do you tell him your desires and your plans and ask him for his wisdom and guidance within it? Is that how it is? I have to remind you of something that I brought out last week that came from verse 4. Paul, Paul is, he says specifically about Jesus, he says he has been raised from the dead. Do you, do you look to Christ as a real, living person who's actually there in the room with you at all times. The intimacy is so intimate that this spirit literally comes and dwells in our bodies, or he will, if we will let him. Do I have such a relationship with him that I desire that this vessel would be a place that he would want to come and dwell and live? And I think about that, and I care about that, and I say, Jesus, I want you in my house. I'm the new temple. Think of the precision that went into the tabernacle and the temple and the way that it was all to be orchestrated. The detail, the way it was to look, the cleanliness, everything that went into it. It's that kind of intimacy with Christ living in me. My journey to salvation is that of an intimate walk with Christ. Rather than a rigid exercise of willpower and my ability to keep checklists. Now, we know the verse. We know it very well. But I don't know how often we actually think of what this really means. Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew said, at the, getting close to the end of his Sermon on the Mount, he said, many are going to say to me, that day is coming. This is one thing I always like to remind myself of all the time. Jesus is coming. He's coming. Is it going to be today or tomorrow or in 30 years? I don't know. He promised he's coming. All of the evidence of his life is there. And he said, when I do, many people, many, not a small, not a marginal group, not a little tiny isolated group, not one little sect over here that was like, we're like, they clearly missed it. No, many, many, that's big, that's bunch, that's a lot of people are going to be surprised on that day because they're going to say, Lord, that's calling him Lord. That means they were a Christian. Didn't we do many mighty works in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do this? That's really our problem, is that we think that the totality is what I did. But the response of Christ is, I never knew you. What does he mean by that? You might have gone out with an idea of things to do, but you never took the time to get to know the Savior and to be close with Him. Man, I want it to be that every one of us is there on that day. Don't we all want to be there on that day? Imagine getting to the end of this life and hearing Him say, I didn't know you. What would that be like? Can you imagine it? The worst hour the worst thing anybody could ever hear. This is why we're doing sermons like this to bring us back into it. Because there are going to be many, I hope it's none, who are in here to whom he'll say, I didn't know you. You did many things and you did them in my name, but I didn't know you. Our journey to salvation is that of an intimate walk that's intimate like that of a marriage, intimate with Jesus. My challenge and the call in this is get to know him. Go into his presence. Talk to him. Make him your Lord. Seek him with all your heart. Say, I want to know you. Tell him if it's a strain to talk to him in conversation. Talk to him about the reasons for it. Say, Jesus, it's just because I don't see your face and it's hard for me to just talk in an empty room. I want to better get past that. What must I do? Be real with him. He loves that. That's what the Psalms are all about. That's what they teach us. He wants a real relationship. He already sees what the struggle is. He just wants to share in it. That's what it is. I want him to say, I knew you. Well done. 
Number three, what does it mean to walk in the new way of the Spirit, or to serve in the new way of the Spirit? It means that the standard of God reaches beyond the page. Now, I'm going to be very careful to say the page still matters. In a moment, we're going to see something that Jesus said to the Pharisee, wherein he said, you missed the big point on this thing that the page may not have particularly dealt with. You should have done that, and also the thing on the page. Because this does matter. This is the breath of God. It does matter. But to walk in the new way of the Spirit means that the standard of God reaches beyond the page. Go back to that dingy room and the rabbi at the front of it. He said, knock on the door. Somebody says, rabbi. He impatiently says, what is it? Well, you're... Your parents are here, and they've given everything that they had to the required temple tax, and they don't have what they need to get the stuff they need for this month. They need just, they're wondering if you can help them get some food or something. And he says, my parents, I haven't talked to them in forever. Tell them that I've already done my tithe the things that I would have given to them, I've already given to the temple. Hmm. He tithed. How much did God tell you to give Old Testament? How much? 10%. I already, I already did it. The standard of God goes beyond the page. Because Jesus told those Pharisees, the very ones that would do things just like this, woe to you. Because you do tithe mint and dill and cumin. Imagine going to your spices and weighing them out by gram and being that precise in what you'd give. You tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the things that actually weigh a lot, namely justice and mercy and faithfulness. In Micah, the prophet said the same thing to Israel when they became just this way. In Micah 6 and verse 8, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The Spirit of God cannot be contained in a few rules. Let me give you another example of what this looks like. The standard goes beyond the page. Is there a verse that tells you you must read your Bible every day. No. No, and most of us know it because we went to check that there was no verse that said it before we went on to not read it. There's no verse that says it. Hmm. Well, <laughs> should we be reading it? How much should I read it? How often should I read it? What should I read? Where should I start? Part of the reason why I don't think there's any command is because back then they, they didn't even have this. But they were... Some years ago I was preaching in East Africa and I met this, these couple of young men. I was preaching in a village. We finished that day of messages, got back in the truck and drove several hours back to where we were staying for the night, and the next day we were preaching in a different location. This was still a long ways away. And I got out that next day, and I went into the meeting house where they had dirt floors and benches that were made by hand. And I saw the same two men that had been there the day before. And I was surprised by it. And come to find out, they had ridden their bicycles. <laughs> They'd left after the previous day and rode their bicycles for hours to go and listen to the same message again. Where's the hunger? What Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Where is that hunger? Jesus told his generation, the queen of the south, who, by the way, came from Sheba, which was in Africa, she traveled from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. 
What was it? Jesus himself. The queen of the south went from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon. But we have Christ, the embodiment of the truth of God, and we couldn't care less. We're apathetic about it. There is no... God's not going to say you have to read it every day. You have to... But my, the point is, what do we learn when we come to this? What are we hungry for? What are we thirsty for? Do we need an exact verse to tell me and I feel justified if I miss it then? I hope not. Number four, what does it mean to walk in the way of the Spirit or to serve in the way of the Spirit, it means that we take our cues from the Spirit of Jesus. Now, we're obviously going to gain a guideline and a, and a shape and a form and a structure for that out of this. This is his revealed will for us. But as you go through your day, you're going to be listening in your conscience, in your heart to what it would be that Christ would will for you to do. Imagine the life of a modern man with a blank canvas before him as he wields the paintbrush of his desires. And he says concerning that day or that year or his whole life, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to paint this and I'm going to put a barn over there and fill it with this. And I'm going to go over and get a degree in this. And I'm going to win a trophy at this. And I'm going to, by the base of my desires, accomplish what it is that I have in mind to do on this blank slate that's before me. That's one way of doing it. Now imagine the life of a Pharisee and before him is a canvas that's black and white with all of the outlines and a bunch of numbers, paint by numbers. And he goes into the day and he knows I have to put this color in that spot and it needs to be in this certain order and that's the way that it's going to be. And when he's finished with the parameters of that painting, he's totally done. I put my mint and my dill and my cumin in green, green, and brown and I put them in that box and I did it and I'm done. The way of Christ Serving in the new way of the Spirit means that you will have an idea in mind of what, generally speaking, it should be. You know what righteousness looks like. You know what Christ did and what he was. You have an idea of complementary colors. You don't put pink with green, and you know texture, and you know depth, and you can do... There's, there's going to be some shape to this, but... It's not going to be so rigidly defined because, again, you cannot contain the Spirit of Christ on a page. You get a really good idea of him, but there's a reason why he comes to live inside of us. Because there cannot be a verse for every single scenario you're in. Don't we know that? Don't we wish at times that there was? Imagine waking up and you see the general shape of your day. Say it was today, it's a Sunday, and you say, I'm going to go and I know generally speaking what I'm to do this day. I'm to be with the saints. I'm to be encouraged by them. I'm to encourage them. I'm to remember the body and blood of my Savior. I'm to commune around his table. I want to hear a word that challenges me for my life. The Christian should desire these things. I'm going to sing praises to him because of all that he's done. And you get a good picture of all of that because you've read it in the New Testament and that's what the Christians did. And that's what we were called to do. And there's a good picture. But on your way... To doing that, you've got this picture in front of you. On your way, you see a woman with her children broken down on the side of the road. Ten minutes till church starts. She has a flat tire. And something in the Spirit of Christ says, right now, that should take precedent. Of course it of course it is that on any given day, we should be with the saints. And he gives this frame and this structure. But there are going to be some of these weighty matters where he's going to say something like, right now, this is the most important thing, that you be right here. There were some days when Eden was in the hospital. And we were not here. We were right there by our bedside. 
She's all hooked up to that stuff. And I was with Christ there too. We're going to take our cues from the spirit of Jesus. And that shape and structure comes from here. But the spirit moves in mysterious ways and you do not see where it's coming or where it's going. Jesus said that of the spirit. So let's not contain him. What can we do? What can we do about this? Well, number one, we can... We can receive and accept that I can't live by the law. That's not going to do anything. We can die to the law through the body of Christ. We can be joined together with him by being immersed. Romans 6 says this. You died when you were baptized. We can die to law, receive Christ by faith in baptism. That's one thing we can do. Another thing is we can desire God. You can really desire him. Do you desire him with a, with a fire, with a hunger? Do you want him really, really badly? If you don't, you don't get it. If you don't, you don't understand the stakes. And you've not seen the supremacy and the glory of God. We can desire him and we can pray, pray, pray. Spend time with Christ. Make him your friend. I would start there. I would start by saying, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. And I want you to be my friend and I want to be close to you. I want to be able to talk to you about anything and everything whenever way of the spirit not the way of the written letter we have a standard now it's the standard of the spirit of Jesus we will not be judged perfectly on that standard primarily because the person of Jesus brought us in under the context of grace implying that there's both a standard and forgiveness whenever we fail to meet it but it's our call this morning to live in that way, to resolve to say my Christian faith is not limited to a few things I do every week. It is my walk with Christ. Walk with him. Know him. He knows you. What will he say when he comes again? Let's draw near to him. Let's sing to him.